My name's Tom C. It's fine. Kropkevich, Kropkevich, if you're Polish. What I put up here, by the way, um, can I point with this? Well, anyhow, I'm going to point with my fingers. Oh, do we have a laser pointer? Is that going to work? How about the green? Who had the green one, Joseph? I can use my finger. Is that okay? If you don't mind. Um, no, it jumped ahead. So, some of my relatives don't have the C at the beginning of the name, which I kind of like because in English, you know, my name looks a little crappy. And I've been getting that for quite a few years. Um, this presentation was kind of inspired. I moved here about a year and a half ago. And I've talked to a lot of younger people that live around here. And I asked them about, well, how did Silicon Valley start? And they said, oh, I think it must have been a computer, right? Well, some of them knew it was HP. Et cetera, et cetera. So I'm more of an audio and acoustics electrical engineering background. <clears throat> so I wanted to put this together. I think everybody knows who this is, right? Who doesn't know who this is? Oh, this is a picture of a more mature Thomas Edison. I think I was named after him. I'm not 100%. He still holds the record, I think, for having the most patents. Um, mostly in media, be it light or sound. And this, by the way, <laughs> that's a few years ago. I think this was summer of 69. In one of my early audio projects, can you see okay? I feel like I'm standing in front of you. Um, so that was one of my first audio projects. Um, this is, brings up where did this term Silicon Valley come from? Even though, depending on what you credit it to, it could go back to 1939. It could go back before that, and I've I got some details here. This brings up a, a, a note from a, an article in Electronic News in 1971. I didn't realize the term was so relatively recent, but there's some details here. And by the way, if any of you want the updated presentation, it's a little, it's got more stuff than what's on your stick. And that goes for my other two presentations, too. So one of the things I learned while walking around Palo Alto is that Lee, is it Lee or Leo DeForest, actually did some work in Palo Alto back in 1910. He, uh, he was involved in the development of the first vacuum tube, which was called the Audion, which you'll notice there'll be a lot of connections to audio stuff here, because that's what I've been doing for a few years, even before I got HP calculators. Respond Anyhow, so I'm going to show you some of these later on, some things about the forest. Fred Turman, um, as you may be aware, he was a professor at Stanford. His father, I learned, by the way, was involved with what we still use as a current IQ test, the Stanford Binet IQ test. I also, by the way, for many of these people, have been to their graves in this area, which I know some people find kind of morbid, but I do it from time to time. So if you want more details there, I can tell you about that. And I think a lot of you probably know a lot of this HP history because you've been fans for so long, but I'll be going over some of that. I also do have an HP 200 oscillator here, which we'll have out on display later on. We're going to take the cover off so you can and, see and them. Mention why that's important. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that, oh. yes. Thank you. Uh, HP's first product, again, as some of you know, was an audio oscillator that Bill Hewlett had patented. It had a very novel circuit using a, a novel use of a nonlinear circuit element, which was a light bulb. And we'll take the cover off and see if it's still in this oscillator here. Also, I wanted to mention the Varian brothers um, were an early, early resident here in uh, what's called the Stanford Industrial Park, which I'm going to show you a little bit about because I live right in the middle of this area. So you know about Stanford University, um, Fred Terman, and then also Shockley. So 1947, and I know I'm jumping around a little bit because I'm trying to cover three different paths here. In 1947, the transistor was invented in Bell Labs. Uh, in the East Coast, and Shockley was one of the inventors, and he he moved here and he started Shockley Semiconductor, and I'll talk a little bit about the semiconductor history and genealogy there. Here is a plaque. Um, it's on the corner of Channing and Emerson. If you ever get to downtown Palo Alto, Palo Alto has two downtowns. Um, this is by the big one by University Avenue, not too far from the Whole Foods, if you know where that is. There's a plaque there in front of a house where the forest had done some of his early work back in 1910.
Furman, I mentioned a little bit about. Um, I'm not going to read this directly, but Hewlett and Packard were two of his students. And I, I recently found that he, uh, he was somehow in contact with one of these engineers from Walt Disney, which is how HP made their contact with Disney to sell these oscillators. Who here has not seen the film Fantasia? Wow, that's impressive. So back in 1939, Walt Disney wanted to do 16 channels of sound. And of course, people thought he was crazy. It failed commercially at the time. And you can read something about the history why it had a resurgence in the 60s, which I remember a little bit of. Um, and that was their first product. I also found this interesting quote um, that Terman had at the bottom here. He said, I had, if I had to live my life over again, I would play the same record. Only because it's another audio reference. <laughs> this, as you may, may know, is the famous garage also in downtown Palo Alto. It's only a few blocks from the, uh, the forest plaque. Um, and you can walk up there. There's also a plaque on the front lawn that the state of California has put up, calling it the birthplace of Silicon Valley, which I find interesting because, as you know, in 1939, when this happened, silicon, as we know it today, really didn't exist, so to speak. <coughs> so this is a picture of a 200A, or maybe this is a B but they're very close. The one I have is a 200C, which is not exactly like their first one, but it's very close. There were some modifications made later to increase the bandwidth and the output voltage level. In the basement of one of the Stanford engineering buildings, um, I don't know who was behind this, but they built a replica of the garage. It's a little study area for the students, and in it, this is an oscillator that Ken Kuhn, I'm sure some of you know him, he's in North Carolina, he's somewhere out on the East Coast. Um, he donated this oscillator and it sits in that replica garage. Here's a picture of Stanford University. I'm going to get into a little geography here because it's kind of close to me in my current situation. It was named, by the way, after Stanford's son who had passed away at 14 or 15 years old. It's a long story in itself. So here I wanted to show you, um, I'm going to use my finger here. This is looking into San Francisco <coughs> Bay. This is Pal the Palo Alto area. Here's the university itself. And that's the next slide. This is, <laughs> don't touch the screen. Don't touch, I know, I'm trying. <laughs> this out here is Stanford Industrial Park, which Terman was also instrumental in telling the university we should buy this land, invest in this park. So Stanford owns all that land. And if you know about rent prices in Palo Alto, I, I can't imagine their revenue. But in any event, and I'm going to try to do this without touching the screen. 1501 Page Mill Road, HP is right here. Park, I'm getting off topic here, but those of you that may know about park, the Palo Alto Research Center of Xerox, where virtually everything we use with computers today was invented and trashed and forgotten, is right here. I work right here. I live right here. CCRMA, which I assume you're not aware of, is the Center for Computer Research and Music and Acoustics, which I've been reading their papers for decades, and now I get to go attend their interesting concerts and other events. So. When I moved here, I noticed what the traffic is like here. I didn't bring a car, even though I'm from Detroit. Um, I still own a home in Detroit, but I couldn't afford to sell it to move here. So I live here, I work here, and I hang out here. So I'm about a mile, 0.2. And it ends up convenient that the walkway through HP, which goes right through here, as long as the gates are open, that's my path to work and back every day. <coughs> So I've lost about 10 pounds, I think. Excuse me. <clears throat> Doing okay on time. <clears throat> this is another overview of the area showing the geography. Again, park, my employment area, 1501 Page Mill, my current home, Karma in the middle of Stanford's campus. Where's the airplane over there? 
airport. SFO is over there. way over there, yeah. San Jose is, I don't know, how far is it from, from here to Palo Alto? 15 miles? So San Jose is coming out way. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I, I'm not sure. I believe Stanford owns all of this property. I'm not sure, but the main industrial park is this area right here. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. This is a picture that uh, I found online. You can't quite get this view because this hill has been redone, so you can't climb up it, although I did a couple of weeks ago. Don't tell anybody. Um, this is part of my walk home every day through 1501 Page Mill Road. This I had to put in here. I don't know if anybody recognizes this address on Prune Ridge Avenue or the address on Wolf Road. This is where the Advanced Products Division was for HP, where it started. And do you know what's here now? Oh, that's why I wonder why that slide was there. <laughs> so here's what's left of Prune Ridge. If you recall, Prune Ridge used to come through and hit Wolf Road, and I believe because I went there back in 1976 when I came to visit you at 2541. I won't tell everybody your address in San Did you participate in the ROM stepping uh, when, we, when we boxed up uh, at... Uh, I, can, I can say no because this was just in the days of the 65. Oh, no. So there were no, were no ROMs yet. But anyhow, I believe Prune Ridge went all the way through and the Wolf Road address and the one on Prune Ridge were right about here. So now a little bit about semiconductor uh, history and genealogy. <coughs> it's interesting if you look up these patents, because on one only Shockley's mentioned. I read in one article that they purposely didn't want Shockley mentioned, and there's a lot of interpersonal stuff back there that you can dig into if you want. And probably you may have heard Shockley. Uh, I'll show you on the slide here. Sorry. There's a few different genealogy charts you'll find online. This one I find interesting because it includes another path that doesn't include Shockley. It started with Hughes Aircraft. But this is what's normally considered the main path, starting with Shockley. These people were known as the Traitorous Eight. They were eight engineers that worked for Shockley, the, whether they didn't like him or his management style or whatever. They left and formed Fairchild. So in any event, there's some interesting ones down here that I've actually been involved with. Signetics in 61, Philco Ford, which was started out in the Philadelphia area. There's other charts like this online that show different levels of detail that you can dig into. This is a plaque um, on San Antonio Road in Mountain View. This is only about a mile or two from the, the HP garage. And it's a very interesting display that's only been finished within the last few months. This was taken just, I took this, I don't know, a month ago. What they've done here, these are large recreations of Shockley's first semiconductors that were done in the building that was here. The building's long gone. They put up these structures. There's actually a circuit in the cement, which I haven't checked the validity of, but there's a circuit down there. There's some plaques on the wall. Um, if you see this on your drive, you can scan in, zoom in on it a little more. Um, there's a bit about Shockley. Here's another genealogy course course. Genealogy chart starting with Shockley, Fairchild, and you can see how it grew from there. The interesting thing is if you follow the semiconductor industry more recently, it's kind of collapsing. You know, other com companies are buying other companies and so on. So, now a little bit about me. Sorry if this is too boring and I won't start crying. Um, my first encounter with HP was probably a frequency encounter in the lab had Nixie tubes. Uh, this is similar to the instrument I worked on back in 72. A professor had a 35 calculator. We were still learning to use those picket calculators that I think Richard or somebody had mentioned. Um, at the time, I could not afford a 35 or a 45, so I bought a TISR-10 and used a page of tables. On one page, I had all my trig and log tables that were close enough. When the 35, I'm sorry, when the 45 came out, the 35 dropped in price, but the local Hudson's department store in Detroit sold the 45 for $300, which I got 
And then finally, later that year, or maybe it was the next year, um, I saved up $700 out of our $3,000 disposable income that year, which is kind of silly, to buy a 65, which I still have. I was member 800 and something of the 65 Users Club. Oh, 65 Users Club. 65, yes, oh, yeah. before PPC. And right. in 76, my wife and I drove out here, visited you. Um, I'm visited sorry, you. I just don't remember. Well, <laughs> I'm really hurt. So, my professors in my numerical methods course made fun of me spending all this money on this toy when we had an IBM 1130 mainframe. In some tests, it was an approximation of pi, which is very sensitive to round off error, and my little toy outran the IBM 1130, and then they shut it. <laughs> it's basically because of the resolution, even using double precision and Fortran at the time, the uh, however many digits we had on the 65 was more robust in that algorithm. So now I'm still, I'm back to talking about me. That's kind of funny because it's related to Hollywood and sound. This is a console I worked on the audio part of in 1981. This went to Glen Glen Sound. A lot of movies you've seen in the 80s were done on this. I don't know if you appreciate how big this thing is. It's about as wide as this room. It's in a mixing studio where you have a dialogue, effects, and music mixer sitting at this. So in 81, those of you that can put this in perspective, each one of these input strips as they had, which the, the audio was pure analog, we can talk more about that outside of this, had a 6502 in it. Each one of these input strips had a 6502, so there were 65, coincidentally, of them talking to each other to a CPM machine that sat outside of this. Parts of it have been through eBay over the decades. It's long gone. What year? What year was that? Tom? It was '81 or '82. Okay. I can only place that because I know at '83 is when I got into automotive stuff, which is where I'm still stuck. I mean, where I still work. Um, yeah, they were probably all NMOS 6502s too before the CMOS versions. I don't remember the power consumption of this thing. The displays up here also had alphanumeric. Dot matrix, I don't know if it was five by seven or what, dot matrix LED displays in each strip. So just some rough background, and I'm getting a little sentimental here, but it's kind of funny how I've kind of gone in a loop. So this was up to about 82, 83, 93, I don't remember. And now I'm back here, kind of strange, because that's the way things happen. Um, I don't mind saying that Phillips semiconductors, probably most all of your car radios have one of these parts in it, which I helped work on back then. That was in 93. So this I just found the other day, and this is quite cosmic. This is a piece of old HP 65 literature. And if you zoom in closely at the bottom, you see the address of where that literature came from. And there's my current business card. <laughs> I saw it and I thought, no, come on, somebody's, <laughs> somebody's dicking with stuff on the web, but that's where I'm back now. So many of that's cool. Some references. One other thing that occurred to me, you know, when my grandparents came here about 100 years ago, both of my grandfathers came here to work for Ford Motor Company. And even though I didn't make it clear, I tried to avoid the auto industry, that's why I went to Pro Audio, but being from Detroit, that's how it happened. Wow. Questions? How about audio questions? 